Aloha! You're watching F5 Web Media On Demand. I'm Peter Silva, Technical Marketing Manager with F5, and we've been hanging out at the RSA conference all week here in San Francisco. And I now have the distinct honor of interviewing Dan Kaminsky. He's the Director of Penetration Testing at IOActive. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to be here. Nice to see you. I'm kind of a little giddy to meet you, finally. Yeah. Good times. And so can you tell us a little bit about IOActive and your role there? Yeah. Uh, I'm the Director of Penetration Testing for IOActive. So uh, I run the hacking group. We have a lot of top flight security engineers. Um, no check boxes. We, we just break stuff. It's what we do. <laughs> I mean, you know, there are people who want check boxes or people who want stuff broken. If you want stuff broken, come talk to us. Beautiful. Uh, we do the entire range from web attacks to uh, hardware engineering. We actually have been doing a lot of work with Smart Grid to make sure that the power supply for the world is actually secure. Wow. So we have a wide range of skills. We were involved with one of the major vendors for uh, the Microsoft Windows Vista project, another of their operating systems. So we came in and worked with them to help them deliver a secure product to the masses. And I believe you've worked on a few of our products a lot over the years. Testing them and such, yeah. See, you're allowed to say it. I, I have to be very circumspect. It's just a, you know. right. And so, um, within the last year, you've been actually credited with finding a, a major vulnerability with the domain name system infrastructure, the DNS cache poisoning vulnerability, mm -hmm. and it's actually named after you. Kind of <laughs> cool. Can you know, the funny thing was, I figured if I didn't give it a name, people would focus on what I was actually proud of, which was getting it fixed. <laughs> I, I was joking, I was calling it massive multi-vendor security remediation, <laughs> and instead people called it the Kaminsky bug. I'm like, that didn't work out like I thought it would. <laughs> Crap. So those who might not be unaware of what that exactly is, what, what is DNS cache poisoning? All right. Well, the way the internet works is, uh, it's like the phone network. Uh, you don't put a name into your telephone. If you want to give someone a call, you have to put in a number. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between the way the internet has numbers and your telephone has numbers. You know, I'm from San Francisco, and my family has had the same phone number for 30 years. Mm -hmm. You know what? I have not had the same IP address for 30 years. Often, I won't have the same IP address for 30 minutes. Sure. So, because numbers move so quickly, we have a directory system. It's like 411 for the internet. But you just always consult it. You consult it all the time. It's very fast. It's very automated. It's called the Domain Name System, or DNS. And the interesting thing about DNS is it's one system with a kind of a centralized route, but it delegates. So, you know, Google gets its space, and Microsoft gets its space, and Yahoo gets its space, and they can manage their own portion of the world, but if they need to find, if Google needs to find Yahoo's mail server, say, Hey, DNS, where is Yahoo's mail server? And it gets an answer. Or Yahoo can say, hey, where's Microsoft's mail server? It gets an answer. And it's not like these companies had to make any prior arrangements or deals or corporate complexity. It's just ask, and an answer comes back. And so it's a very nice system where delegated control exists, but everyone can, you know, find whatever information they need to make their protocols function. And so at the end of the day, DNS is at the heart of why organizations are allowed to speak to each other. Uh, it is the cross-organizational glue that ultimately every database, every mail server, every web server, every web browser, everything ultimately comes back to DNS when they need to find where is that other guy anyway. Right. So it's very critical, obviously, to the survival of the internet. And, and you, you, know, you ask local... And if local doesn't know, you ask ISP. And if ISP doesn't know, then it goes ask root. If root knows if it's a .com, it says go ask TLD, the top level yeah. domains. Top level domain says, oh, I know where it is. You go ask this guy. It's it's a way of bouncing around till you get the right answer with a actual reasonable amount of trustworthiness. Right. You know the, the funny thing is is before you know there on the one hand there's it works. On the other hand is it works securely. And if it's between works and works securely. Like if it has, to, if it works securely, but it normally doesn't work, people won't deploy it. Right. So generally, it's very funny. I've stood in a room and I've said to a hundred engineers, "How many of you think you depend on DNS?" Two hands go up. Now I say, 
How many of you, anywhere in your products, have somewhere where you put in a host name of some machine you need to speak to, and a hundred hands go up, and I go, where do you think that IP address comes from? And I go, oh. It's funny. It, it's really funny. Like, you know, people underestimate this thing. But to be fair, it, it works so well that, I mean, look at this one. The things that make the DNS ultimately work are these things called root servers. And there are 13 of them that are distributed around the globe, at least organizationally. And uh, these 13 servers were there 20 years ago. These 13 servers will be there 20 years from now. You tell me what else on the internet could possibly have a 40 year window of existence. I tell you, there's nothing. Okay. So that is why so many things have ultimately used DNS as a foundational technology to allow themselves to function. And, and because it works so well, sometimes we often forget, right? And that, that happens in a lot of things, right? Because certain things work so well, you, you often forget the criticality of it and, you and remember, the importance of it. You, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, man. Yeah. Yeah. Things that break a lot, you go, okay, I know about this because it breaks a lot. The things that are just quietly working, yeah, just assumes that can't be the problem. Right. And so one of the funny things that we've seen happen is uh, people tend not to firewall or otherwise manipulate DNS because when it breaks, nobody knows how to debug it. If some other system breaks somewhere, and they're like, wait a second, what is going on here? And they'll spend 15, 20, 100 hours to find out the problem. And then, only then, do they trace it back to the guy who messed with DNS. Right. So that guy who messed with DNS now has 100 hours of pain in somewhere else in the organization to account for. And that's why, ultimately, no one messes with the protocol. They just leave it there. They hope it never breaks. And it's like, there's a little tiny corner that everything depends on. And so with all those answers that are already out there, and many of them cached, with DNS cache poisoning, that then allows somebody who's who's not authorized or, or you know somebody to step in the middle of the request and redirect that to, say, a malicious server or their own. Exactly. I mean, a simple model of cache poisoning might be, you think you're going to Google, but that's not Google. You think you're going to the bank, but that's not your bank. Where things got fascinating once I started really digging into cache poisoning was when I started looking at the web and the way the web does authentication. Mm. So you have a username, you have a password, but because you're a human being, you forget stuff. So every major website has a forgot my password button. So how does this thing work? Well, it sends you an email and you have to click on the link and you go ahead and say, yeah, it's me. So it sends you an email. What does it know? how to send you that email. Well, it looks it up and, oh, that's right, DNS. Yes. So if I control DNS for a website, I control mail for a website, I control mail for a website, I can log in and get administrator credentials on that website. And that's where it turns scary. And that's when you start realizing, wait a second, this little piece, this cross-organizational globe we've been depending on, oh my God. It will just get you into everything. It is shockingly a skeleton key. Right. Now the funny thing is, when I found this bug, I knew it was bad. Like I knew it was a problem. Um, but I figured, well, everyone knows DNS is important. I don't need to like teach people this. I mean, give me a break. Um, and I got some very interesting feedback. Like, oh come on, DNS can't be that important. I'm like, well, looks like I got some work to do. <laughs> And, uh, uh, yeah, by the time I finished out that deck, I mean, uh, people were like, ah, wow, we, we have, uh, we sort of have a lot built on that deck of cards, don't we? Yeah. And I still have that. I, I downloaded it the day it became available and read through it. It's really interesting. So next week, there's a webinar coming up for DNSSEC. Mm -hmm. It's yourself, uh, Cricket Lou with Infoblox. It's a, it's a combined effort with F5 Networks and Infoblox hosting mm -hmm. this webinar. Yourself. Cricket, Scott Rose with NIST, yep. and our own Nathan Myra, product manager for Global Traffic Manager. 